This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. I want to talk about Benedict XVI's recent book, Jesus of Nazareth, The Infancy Narratives. So far I've read 30 of Benedict XVI's books. In his most recent book, The Infancy Narratives, there are two major heresies, along with many other statements of modernism that are extremely revealing. I previously did a video on the second book of his three-part series on Jesus of Nazareth, that was called Jesus of Nazareth Holy Week. In that book, as was covered in the video, there are numerous massive heresies, including Benedict XVI's statement that the Gospel of Matthew is historically inaccurate. Let's look at the two major heresies in this book, and then we will consider the extremely revealing statements of modernism that I believe reveal the true agenda of his series on Jesus of Nazareth. The first blatant heresy in this book comes on page 11. Quote, the man Jesus is the dwelling place of the Word, the eternal divine Word, in this world. Jesus' flesh, his human existence, is the dwelling or tent of the Word. The reference to the sacred tent of Israel in the wilderness is unmistakable. End quote. Here Benedict XVI clearly teaches the anathematized heresy of Nestorius, condemned at the Council of Ephesus and in subsequent councils, that Jesus is a man in whom the Word dwelt rather than the Catholic truth that Jesus is the Word made flesh. This is a significant heresy on Benedict XVI's part, for the Word of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, did not dwell in Jesus. Rather, Jesus is the Word, not one who carries the Word. That's a crucial distinction. Those who are not attuned to details on these points might think this is splitting hairs. It is not. The aforementioned distinction is relevant to core faith in Christ as one divine person with two natures. And Benedict XVI knows what he is writing. His words are carefully chosen. He even writes it twice, as we see here. He says, Jesus is the dwelling place of the word. And he says it again here. He is familiar with Christological heresies condemned by Catholic councils. And in fact, notice how clearly what he says is condemned in these dogmatic statements of the Council of Ephesus. In the Council of Ephesus, we see that the council declared, but we do not say that the word of God dwelt in him lest Christ be thought of as a God-bearing man. So, we do not say that the Word of God dwelt in Christ. That's exactly what Benedict XVI says. Jesus is the dwelling place of the Word. That is heresy. Jesus is not the dwelling place of the Word. He is not a man who carries the Word. He is not a man inspired by the Word. He is the Word. One person with two natures. This idea that Jesus was a man who carried the word, or one in whom the word of God dwelt, as Benedict XVI teaches, was also anathematized in this canon. Quote, if anyone dares to say that Christ was a God-bearing man, and not rather God in truth, being by nature one son, let him be anathema. That's the first major heresy in his book. Now, the next major heresy in his book speaks to, I think, the larger agenda of his series on Jesus of Nazareth. When Benedict XVI discusses the scriptural accounts about the life of Jesus, he will go on and on about how those accounts are rich with symbolic meaning. He will explain how this symbolizes this, and this symbolizes that, and this represents that, and this shows us that. And while the points he covers are often interesting to consider, a reader who has faith and is carefully considering what he says is left with the impression that Benedict XVI is subtly implying that the reason the scriptural accounts are so rich with symbolic meaning and the reason that this connects with that and this connects with this is not because God ordained that it worked that way but rather because the author crafted the story so that it would have symbolic value so that it would fit with other things that have significance in the religion in other words he's subtly indicating that the scriptural accounts are not facts of history, but rather fictionalized stories, which the author carefully crafted to have symbolic value and purposefully tried to connect with other things that are believed or recorded or held in the religion. And the way that he does this is extremely subtle, extremely insidious, and extremely revealing. And the next major heresy pertains to this point. On pages 118 to 119 of his book, Benedict XVI discusses Scripture's account about the wise men from the East and the flight into Egypt. 
And he says, quote, the question arises, how are we to understand all this? Are we dealing with history that actually took place? Or is it merely a theological meditation under the guise of stories? In this regard, Jean Danielou rightly observes, the adoration of the Magi, unlike the story of the Annunciation, does not touch upon any essential aspect of our faith. No foundations would be shaken if it were simply an invention of Matthew's based on a theological idea. So Benedict XVI is opening up the question, are these just stories that have been made up, or is this actual history? And he cites Jean Danielou, and he says he rightly points out that if they were simply inventions, nothing would be impacted. Notice how he's trying to sow doubt. He's trying to put the position that scripture's accounts are inventions on a par with the position that scripture's accounts are history. And what he says here is not just a wicked, subtle implication. This statement is actually blatant heresy. He says, Jean Danielou rightly observes that nothing would be impacted if scripture's account about the wise men was an invention. That is heresy because the church infallibly teaches that scripture is inspired, accurate, and is infallible in its historical accounts as well. As we read in papal encyclicals such as these two that I've quoted here, Spiritus Paracletus points out, quote, those two who hold that the historical portions of scripture do not rest on the absolute truth of the facts are no less than the aforementioned critics out of harmony with the church's teaching. So Benedict XVI's statement is blatant heresy. It should also be kept in mind that heresy is not only a denial of a divinely revealed truth, but also a doubt. So for instance, if someone said, I'm not denying that Jesus is God, I'm just not sure, that's heresy, to deny or to doubt a divinely revealed truth. In the same way, when someone says, I'm not denying that scripture is historically accurate, I'm just saying I'm not sure, or that one could legitimately question it. That is heresy. So, in addition to this passage being blatantly heretical, it gives us a clear insight into the larger agenda of his series on Jesus of Nazareth when he says, or is it merely a theological meditation under the guise of stories? That's his purpose, to subtly inculcate that scripture's accounts are fictional stories theological meditations that have been invented. And this paragraph is interesting because he opens up by asking the question, and then he agrees with Jean Danielou that nothing would be impacted if the wise men and the flight into Egypt were an invention. And then he says he personally thinks it's historical. And then he says that exegets, as ecclesially minded as these two individuals, have rejected historicity. So he says, is it historical? Nothing would be impacted if it's not historical. I personally think it is historical, but church-minded exegetes have rejected that it's historical or have left the question open. So he's sowing doubt. He's putting the positions that it's historical, that it's not historical, and that it might not be historical on a par. Let's look at some more examples in his book. On page 102, Benedict XVI is talking about the wise men and their use of the term king of the Jews. And he says this is a typically non-Jewish expression. And he points out that this term, king of the Jews, does not reappear until Jesus' trial and the inscription over the cross. And he says, so we could say that here, as the first Gentiles inquire after Jesus, there are already echoes of the mystery of the cross. It's very subtle and insidious and clever. But what he's doing and saying is that this phrase, King of the Jews, is atypical, and we only find it used by the wise men and in the story of the cross. And therefore, when the wise men use it, Benedict XVI concludes, we already see echoes of the mystery of the cross. What he's implying is that the author who created this fiction, by using this atypical term, King of the Jews, in the story of the wise men, is already echoing or looking forward to what he's going to be telling us in the story of the cross. And if you're not convinced that that's what he's implying, that it's all a fictional story, the next part of this really confirms my point. He goes, these echoes can be heard clearly in the reaction to the Magi's question about the newborn king. Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And he says that it's understandable that Herod was troubled, 
But less understandable, though, is the fact that all Jerusalem seems to have been troubled as well. This element could be an anticipation of Jesus' regal entrance into the holy city on the eve of his passion when Matthew says that the whole city was quaking. He's doing the same thing. He's saying that it doesn't make sense why all of Jerusalem would be troubled. And he says this could be an anticipation of the later story about how the whole city was quaking when Jesus entered the holy city. If you read it carefully, he's clearly implying, even though it's very craftily done, that the author who is creating this fictional story, by saying that all Jerusalem was troubled, which doesn't make sense, is anticipating what he's going to be telling us later in this fictional story, that when Jesus entered the city, the entire city was troubled or quaking to make it have a symbolic harmony. That's what he's implying, that it's all just a fairy tale where one part conforms to or fits with another, not because God ordained it that way, but because the author was anticipating what he would tell us later so that the parts would have a neat symbolic connection. It's extremely evil and insidious. And I should probably mention that this quote, as well as the rest of the quotes I'm going to cover in this video, are different from the first two that I covered, insofar as the first two quotes we looked at are examples of blatant heresy. They are absolutely indefensible. They prove that Benedict XVI is a heretic and not a pope, along with his many other heresies. This quote, as well as the rest of the quotes we're going to look at, speak to his larger agenda, his subtle program to sow doubt in the biblical accounts. Benedict XVI's intention in this series is to have the general reader come away with the empty impression that the gospel accounts are fairy tales or possibly fairy tales. And there's no doubt that that's his agenda, as the evidence we will continue to see shows. The next example comes on pages 122 to 123. Benedict XVI is discussing how early in his life Jesus was missing from Mary and Joseph for three days when they found him in the temple. And he says, the three days may be explained in quite practical terms. Mary and Joseph had spent one day traveling north, a further day was needed in order to retrace their steps, and on the third day they eventually found Jesus. But he goes on, While the three days are thus a perfectly plausible chronological indication, one must nevertheless agree with René Laurentin when he detects here a silent reference to the three days between cross and resurrection. These days are spent suffering the absence of Jesus, days of darkness. What he's saying is that while the three days could be chronologically plausible, what they actually are are a reference to the three-day absence of Jesus after his death on the cross. He's clearly implying that the three days are not historical, but were rather a device on the part of this author of fiction to connect with what he tells us later about how Jesus was missing for three days after his death on the cross. It was a literary connective on the part of the author to make the story thematically consistent or rich. That's what he's implying, and that's confirmed by the language he uses. He doesn't say that God arranged it, that Jesus would be missing for three days in both cases. That's not what he says. He says that the three-day reference in Luke 2 is a silent reference to the three days between cross and resurrection. This emphasizes the role of the human author, who, in his view, is consciously including three days to make it fit with what he tells us later, namely that Jesus is missing for three days after his death on the cross. In other words, it's just a clever work of fiction. His goal is to convince people, as he revealed earlier in the quote we considered, that the biblical accounts are merely theological meditations under the guise of stories. Before we look at more examples, it should be mentioned that Benedict XVI's program in this book is in one sense subtle and in one sense clear. It's subtle in some passages, while in others what he's attempting to do is much more obvious. It's also subtle from the standpoint of the general person in the Novus Ordo, who would never expect him to be undermining the biblical accounts, which leaves that person perplexed by Benedict XVI's words, whereas what he's doing is clear for a more faithful and attentive reader who is carefully analyzing what he says.
Now another example of what we're talking about comes on page 121 where he's talking again about the short narrative about the 12 year old Jesus and he says that this narrative brings out the link between radical newness and equally radical faithfulness and he says indeed I would say it is the actual theological content that this story is intended to convey this implies that the account of a 12 year old Jesus in the temple was not a record of a historical event but a story calculated to bring out theological content to teach that Jesus is both radically new and radically faithful in other words it's a theological meditation under the guise of a story this passage is more subtle but that's what he means another example of what we're talking about comes on page 117 Benedict the 16th discusses Isaiah's prophecy that there shall come forth a shoot Nezer from the stump of Jesse he also in this context discusses Jesus's title of Nazareth and he raises questions about whether the title of Nazareth could legitimately be applied to Jesus in this context he mentions this prophecy how there will come a shoot Nezer from the stump of Jesse and he says indeed we have good reason to suppose that Matthew detected in the name of Nazareth a prophetic reference to the shoot and that he saw the use of the designation of Nazareth for Jesus as a sign of the fulfillment of God's promise to draw new life from the dead stump of Jesse what he's doing here is he's implying that Matthew detected that the name of Nazareth would correspond to an Old Testament prophecy and therefore he used this designation for Jesus in other words, Matthew was an author of fiction attempting to make the claims about Jesus correspond to known prophecies. And so his point is that since the Hebrew word nezer, which means shoot, which is connected with the prophecy of Isaiah, that a shoot shall come forth from the stump of Jesse, has a correspondence to the word Nazareth, Benedict XVI is saying that Matthew detected the connection and that he saw by designating Jesus to be of Nazareth there could be a fulfillment not that there was a fulfillment not that history showed that Jesus fulfilled it but that Matthew saw that the name of Nazareth could connect with that prophecy and therefore applied it to Jesus to find the fulfillment in other words it's all a fairy tale a work of fiction another interesting example comes on page 126 Benedict the 16th is speaking about scripture's account in which Jesus is said to grow in wisdom and stature. He says to the saying about Jesus' growth in wisdom and stature, Luke adds a formula taken from the first book of Samuel. The evangelist is once again making a connection between the story of Samuel and the story of Jesus' childhood. In the story of Jesus, so the evangelist is telling us with this citation, the story of Samuel is being repeated on a higher plane in a definitive manner. It's subtle, but again, what he's attempting to do is create the impression that this reference in Luke to Jesus growing in wisdom and stature is simply a repeat of the story of Samuel on a higher plane. In other words, it's not something that really happened. It's just an embellishment of a story or a tradition held dear in the religion. Another example comes on pages 70 to 71. Benedict the 16th is talking about Luke 2:7 and the statement Mary gave birth to her firstborn son. He says the reference to the firstborn is also an anticipation of the account soon to follow of Jesus's presentation in the temple. Pauline theology took the idea of Jesus as firstborn two steps further. So he's saying that there's a development going on. He proceeds to say in the letter to the Colossians the idea is developed further. Christ is called firstborn of all creation. What he's doing here is he's saying that these ideas about Jesus, that he's the firstborn of all creation, were not present in the initial revelation, but they were developed and expanded. He goes on to say the concept of the firstborn takes on a cosmic dimension. So the idea that Jesus has a primacy in the whole cosmos, that wasn't part of the initial revelation. That's something that was developed and invented. And what he means is really clear in this statement. He says, Luke does not speak in these terms, yet for us, reading his gospel with the benefit of hindsight, this cosmic glory is already present. This is typical modernism. 
The modernists will frequently contend that Christian faith or dogma was not historical truth, but something that began with a person's experience or myth or tradition that was expanded and reformulated and that subsequent generations latched onto those expansions and read them back into the initial experience or tradition or myth. That's what he's saying here. He's saying that the idea that Jesus has a cosmic primacy or that he's the cosmic king, king of the universe, that's not in Luke's revelation. But for those who read with the benefit of hindsight, after we've imbibed all of these invented traditions, then we see it in the initial account. We read it back into the initial account. This is pure evil, pure heresy, pure filth. And this is the true character of this demonic figure falsely posing as Pope when he's nothing more than an antichrist apostate. This demonic, heretic, and anti-pope is playing a key role in the great apostasy and final spiritual deception of mankind. In fact, it's very interesting to note how what he says in the quote we just looked at so corresponds to what Pius X condemned in his 1907 encyclical against the modernists. Pius X explained that the modernists apply experience to tradition. Benedict XVI, in his heretical book, Principles of Catholic Theology, we have an article about it on the website, says that speech only fulfills its function of preserving history if it is open to the ever new experiences of new generations and so maintains its ability to give expression to the tradition that is continually in the process of formation. What Benedict XVI says in this heretical book is exactly what Pius X condemned. He's saying that history is preserved, or tradition is preserved, only if the ever new experiences of new generations are applied to it, thus giving expression to the tradition that is continually in the process of formation. Hence, history and tradition are not things that are handed down, but developed, reformulated by people's experience. That is heresy, and that's what he's saying in this quote we just looked at. He's saying that Luke does not speak of the cosmic glory of Jesus. Yet for us, reading the gospel with the benefit of hindsight, we read it back into the account. This cosmic glory is already present because, as this heretic contends, it was developed. That's what the demonic heretic is saying. Another example comes on page 109. Benedict the 16th is again talking about the flight into Egypt and return to the land of Israel. He says, quote, The historicity of the event is admittedly questioned by a number of exegetes on the basis of a further consideration. What we encounter here is the widespread motif of the persecuted child king, one that contemporary literature applied to Moses in a form that could have served as a model for this story about Jesus. What he's saying is that some exegetes question the historicity of this event because some ancient traditions had stories about a persecuted child king that could have served as the basis for a fictional story that was incorporated into scripture. He goes on, It must be said, though, that most of the examples cited fail to convince. Most of the examples? So what he's saying is that some of the examples apparently do convince him that the story in scripture about the flight into Egypt was not historical. This is evil heresy. I should point out that the so-called traditions which he brings up to sow doubt in Scripture's account are very different from the scriptural account about the flight into Egypt and return to the land of Israel. They provide no reason whatsoever for doubting what Scripture records. On this point, Benedict XVI goes on on the next two pages to speak about the same event, and he says, quote, with a rather different end in view. Matthew himself alludes to the Moses story, hoping to find there the interpretation of the whole event. Out of Egypt I called my son. This is more subtle, but what he's saying is that Matthew was, again, looking for a thematic link, that he was hoping to find a fulfillment of prophecy, subtly implying that this author of fiction wasn't just setting down facts which correspond to prophecies, but looking for ways to find the fulfillment in the figure he was writing about. While there are other quotes we could look at, the final example I want to discuss in this book comes on pages 34 to 35. Benedict the 16th is discussing Mary's reply to the angel recorded in Luke 1:34, How shall this be since I have no husband or since I know not man? When the angel Gabriel tells her what's going to happen, 
Benedict XVI comments on this and he says, This question seems unintelligible to us, because Mary was betrothed. He goes on to discuss the possible explanations for what she meant. He says, Since St. Augustine, one explanation that has been put forward is that Mary had taken a vow of virginity. But this theory is quite foreign to the world of the Judaism of Jesus' time. What he's saying is that these words recorded of Mary in Luke 134, how shall this be, since I have no husband or since I know not man, are mysterious. He then discusses the possible explanations for those words, and he rejects every single one of them. He says the idea that she had taken a vow of virginity, that doesn't work. He says a satisfying answer has yet to be found by modern exegesis. He goes on to say, some say that at this point, having not yet been taken into the marital home, Mary had no dealings with men, yet she saw the task as immediately pressing. But this fails to convince. And he goes on, yet this is no real explanation. Yet this does not solve the problem either. So the riddle remains. Now think about this. Why would Benedict XVI address the words of Mary in Luke 134, words that are crucial to Christian slash Catholic tradition and words which are recorded in scripture, say that they're mysterious, say that no explanation for them makes sense whatsoever, shoot down and dismiss every explanation that has been advanced for how those words make sense. Why would he do that? And offer no explanation of his own? Think about it. He's a man who claims to be the Pope, who is supposedly charged with upholding the truth of Scripture's words, the truth of Catholic teaching. Yet he offers no explanation for how these words make sense and rejects every explanation that has been offered. It's obvious. The only reason he would bring up the topic and not offer an explanation for how they make sense is to sow doubt in the biblical account. I could see one addressing the topic and analyzing all the objections if you have answers which can highlight the truth of Scripture, which can explain how these words make sense. Since he has no explanation and he rejects all of the explanations, the only reason he would bring them up is to leave the reader with the final impression that the words are doubtful. And that's exactly his purpose and his plan. That's what you're dealing with in the demonic heretic of Benedict XVI. And as I've mentioned in this video, and I believe proven with the facts I've covered, the purpose of this book and his series on Jesus of Nazareth is to attack the truth of the biblical accounts about Jesus. Because what scripture and tradition record about Jesus Christ cut to the heart of the Christian faith. Once that is denied or doubted, everything goes out the window. And so the devil's primary henchman in our day, Benedict XVI, wants to undercut the very foundation of Christianity. And that's what he's attempted to do in this series. I believe his target audience in this book is not, of course, real traditional Catholics, but I believe it's the more conservative people in the Novus Ordo or people out there in the world who are searching and looking to him, thinking that he actually believes in scripture, thinking that he actually believes in Catholic teaching. And when they read his book, even though they will probably lack the grace to recognize what he's all about and what he's really doing, they will perceive in the back of their minds that he doesn't really even believe what scripture records, that he's constantly questioning it and sowing doubt about it. And it will leave the average person in the Novus Ordo and the general person out there searching in the empty and dark place that even the man who is the supposed leader of the Christian church doesn't feel very strongly about scripture's accounts about Jesus. And it will destroy or weaken any vestige of conviction they have in Jesus. That's his goal. That's his purpose. And that's why it's important to expose this demonic heretic. In our video on the apocalypse, Is the World About to End? We cover what we think Benedict XVI's role in the apocalypse is. But there's no doubt about it. It's a fact that he's a manifest heretic. He's not the Pope. The people who defend him, who reject the evidence that he's a heretic and not the Pope, are defending a devil. They are defending a man who attacks the truth about Jesus Christ. And unless they convert, they will not escape before the judgment seat of Christ.